This is week three of this current message series, What Do We Look Like? In the first week, we looked at how Peter had spoken to the people uh, after the resurrection, and we heard how the whole community remained faithful to the teaching of the apostles, to the brotherhood, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. This passage from the book of Acts told us that everyone, all 3,000 of those who followed who accepted Christ's uh, message or Peter's message that day, turned their lives around and they believed in the risen Lord. And I ended my homily that weekend by paraphrasing the final verses of our first reading that was taken from the Acts of the Apostles. I suggested it might form part of a basis for a vision for our parish for what we might look like in five years' time. This is how I paraphrased it that we meet daily for the breaking of the bread. We share our food, our gifts, our resources generously and gladly. We are praising God continually and each day the Lord is adding to our numbers. And I ask then, do we dare to dream such a dream? Now I'm not going to ask you for any answers right now, but if anyone wants to share what they thought about a response to that, I'm happy to hear your story at any time. Last weekend, Deacon Mick asked the question that if we were to be arrested, what would we say that would convince the arresting officer that we were guilty of being a Christian? Both the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospel reading, the story of the road to Emmaus, reminded us that we can know about the Lord, we can know something of his story, but it doesn't always mean that we've taken it to heart. We don't always live it as we're called to be as Christ's followers. Because Peter had said to the crowd that had gathered, what you see and hear is the outpouring of the Spirit. It wasn't quite as explicit But in the gospel passage, we hear how after Jesus had disappeared, the disciples said, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? So we're not only called to remain faithful to the teaching of the apostles, to the brotherhood, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers, but we're also called to be open to the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead which means that all of us need to be a people of prayer, but especially a people who are praying for the coming of the Spirit in our lives and in our community. I was fortunate early in February with four parishioners to attend the Divine Renovation Conference that was held in Sydney. And we were reminded there that there are three keys to the to parish renewal but the three keys are linked around a crucial central point and that is the centrality of the Eucharist in our story in our journey as Catholic Christians. The three keys are suggested as being an important part of how parishes change. In no particular order they are the best of leadership, the primacy of evangelization and the power of the Holy Spirit. So the story of the Spirit is an important part of what we're about as Christ followers. And in our first reading today from the Acts of the Apostles, Peter puts out a fairly direct message to those who were gathered. He said, The whole of Israel can be certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Remember that the people who are hearing this message are Jews who have gathered in Jerusalem for the the end of the feast of um, fe- of the weeks of feast. They knew the story about the Messiah. They knew the Messiah was to come, but they didn't recognise Jesus. And now Peter is standing up and saying, "Jesus is." the Lord and Messiah. Now the Spirit worked on those who were gathered because they asked immediately, what must we do? 
and Peter said, you must repent. Now, they already knew that message because that was the message that John the Baptist had preached. But John the Baptist had preached a message simply for the forgiveness of sins. But the repentance that Peter is speaking about is so much more. Peter is saying, you must be baptised in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, yes, but so that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So right from the very beginning of this journey, everyone who is being a Christ follower is being told that they will receive this gift of the Holy Spirit and it will be a power which works within them. They'll have, because of that spirit, a new relationship with the God who created them. Last week at the clergy plenary, we were asked to look at the, the question of the best of leadership. How do we lead people in our parishes? And the emphasis was on leading, not telling people what to do and not doing everything ourselves, as a lot of clergy try to do, and not just being a leader, but we were being invited to lead from within a team. Now that's asking a lot of us as priests, not because we're dumb, but because at no stage in our training for priesthood did we ever have any preparation to lead except to model the priest who was our first parish priest. Now depending what that was like, determined how you would do things. I'm not going to uh, mock Father Ted Lloyd, but he had a particular style of leadership and he was my first parish priest. Mate, this is what you do. <laughs> and I suffer, no, I didn't suffer for it, but it was a particular direction. Thanks, Ted. But as we listen to the beginning of our reading from the Acts of the Apostles today, we hear Peter leading from a team. We're told, on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd. He didn't stand up by himself. He stood up with the eleven. Now, you might think, hang on, didn't Judas die and there was only ten? Well, even before Pentecost, the disciples recognised that they needed to have this unity, this 12 who would be the people who would lead the church. So in the first chapter of Acts, we're told that they gathered and they chose someone who has been with us for the whole of the time that we walked with Jesus and listened to his teaching and Matthias had been chosen. So right from the beginning, they had replaced him so that when they witnessed to the people, they were witnessing as a community. Peter had, but was, the, was the head of the group, yes, but he spoke from within the twelve. We're told that as he finished preaching that day, there were 3,000 who had been added to their number. And they were added to the number because the words he spoke were the words that spoke about the power of the Spirit. I wonder what would happen if 3,000 people today heard me preach and they suddenly wanted to be Christ followers. Now, I had a discussion about this the other night and um, people said, well, it'd take you a long time, you'd be there for the next two weeks baptising them. Irrespective of that position, would we even think that's possible? Most of us would say no. It's not even remotely possible. And yet, when I was baptised, when I was confirmed, I received that same spirit. And we're told that when we preach, when we teach, when we speak, do not worry about what you say because the spirit of God will be with you. So why do we think it almost impossible that 3,000 people could hear the word of God today and want to become Christ followers. Father Greg Bellamy, who was one of the two key speak or three key speakers at our clergy plenary, 
said we need to have God-sized dreams. Not man-sized dreams, not our-sized dreams, but God-sized dreams. And what about the dream that today there might be someone with a vocation to the priesthood or religious life who's sitting in the congregation? When I moved forward to go to the seminary, there were three other people from St Virgil's in 1968 who were either going to the seminary or to the Christian Brothers. And it was kind of a, a little bit of a support to know that you weren't doing something by yourself. The fact that I was the only one ordained or who went through to final vows didn't, doesn't mean anything. But at the time, I wasn't by myself. There were other people who were walking with me. One of the things and the reason we already bring that up today is that as well as being the fourth Sunday of Easter, it is also known as Good Shepherd Sunday, a Sunday on which we pray for vocations to the priesthood, to the clergy, to religious life. It's a day in which we recognise as the readings are always about Jesus and the good, as the Good Shepherd. It's a, it's a reminder to us that God is inviting us into something much bigger. Our gospel today reminded us, as Pope Francis reminds us frequently, that we need to have the smell of the sheep about us. Paraphrasing the gospel slightly, we're told that the shepherd of the flock, the sheep hear their voice, and one by one they are called, and, they, and, and the shepherd leads them out. That's something that each of us can do. It's not just priests and religious who do that. Every one of us can be shepherds leading others to the Lord. But we need ministers of the church, leaders of our communities, who also have that extra vocation of saying that this is the only thing I'm going to be focused on. I'm going to separate myself from other aspects of human life in order to focus on this as a particular gift, a particular uh, opportunity to spread the good news. So, do we believe that there is somebody here who might be? And it doesn't have to be a young person. Most of us think of um, vocations to the priesthood and religious life as something that happens when you're a child or when you're young. Um, Deacon Mick is an obvious example of saying it doesn't happen just when you're a young person. It can be at a later stage in life. So going back to the three keys that I spoke of earlier, I want to finish just with reminding us about the power of the Holy Spirit as that's an important part of our message today. We know that the early Christ followers were empowered by the Holy Spirit and that power helped them to change human society. They experienced incredible difficulties, incredible challenges, but they went out confident, that God was with them in a new and wonderful way. And they did it as part of a community that walked with them. And so I go back to that sense of vision, that we're a community who walks together to live the story of the good news. We know that because they changed the world, we have been given the church or the community we call the church today. My prayer is that our lives will be similarly changed, that the power of the Spirit who comes upon us will make us a people who are witnesses to God's good news, that we might change the particular community in which we live, starting here with us who gather at, at St Mary's, but also have an impact on others whom we meet during the week, so that they too, empowered by the Spirit, will know the glory of God and will build up the kingdom of God each and every day.